Hello and welcome to week four of the Gates Air Connect virtual events webinar series. Uh, tonight's uh, webinar is the final one for this week, so thank you for joining us. Uh, today's webinar, FM, FM SFNs, a toolkit to extend radio coverage. Our very own Rich Redmond, president of Gates Air International, will discuss how significant advances in FM transmitters have been able to augment signal coverages using real-time adaptive precision, time delay control, software coverage planning tools. Before we begin the pre presentation, we're just going to take just a quick three minute break um, and just to allow everyone to get registered and get uh, get logged in. So please sit back, relax, and we'll just see you in just a few minutes. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Gates Air Connect virtual events webinar series. This is Teresa Crippen, Global Events Manager for Gates Air. We really appreciate all of you connecting with us today or this evening, depending where you're at in the world. Um, in place of many canceled face-to-face -face events and trade shows, we've got lots of interactive content for you to see over the next several weeks. Um, and also in the past weeks, which you can see on our uh, gatesair.com webpage in the media section, um, and all of these are brought to you by our virtual event series. In today's webinar, FM SFNs, a toolkit to extend radio coverage, our very own Rich Redmond, president of Gates Air International, will discuss how significant advances in FM transmitters have been able to augment signal coverages using real-time adaptive precision, time, de time delay control, and software coverage planning tools. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, so we encourage you to type in any questions that you have in the Microsoft Teams Q&A panel, and I'll make an announcement now so you can see exactly where to type those. Okay, that's been posted. Um, so we, we will be answering those questions as they come in at the end of the presentation, so just feel free to enter them as soon as you think of them, and we'll get to them after the uh, webinar is over. Um, so without further delay, let's start the webinar. Please welcome Mr. Rich Redmond. Rich?
Good evening to everyone. Hopefully uh, you can see the uh, slides. Appreciate everyone making some time to join us, whether it's in the morning or afternoon uh, or um, uh, or uh, late at night for you. So thank you very much. Um, actually, Rich, I don't have your slides up yet. Oh, OK. How about now? There's just a slight delay. Yep, now we're good. Thank you. OK, perfect. There we go. So uh, we're going to be talking about FM, uh, mostly FM analog, but we will talk about FM digital and some comparisons to some other uh, digital broadcast uh, uh, networks for radio and TV. But, uh, you know, throughout time, a little bit of a history, uh, you know, FM broadcast have been around for a long time and offered many benefits over AM. But one of the main differences uh, was that FM signals were a line of sight coverage, meaning wherever your receiver was generally needed to see the transmitter. Now, while FM can certainly be demodulated with some reflections, uh, but unlike AM, uh, you know, it's, it, it's not a large blanket coverage irrespective of terrain. And so uh, generally, ideally sighted FM stations were very tall towers or towers on top of mountains. They had a great look angle across a wide uh, geography with a sufficient amount of power to reach the populations. Uh, but in a lot of cases, there may be some sort of terrain that blocks the signal in what might have otherwise been a portion of the station's coverage area. So in the drawing we have in the slide, you can kind of see that the dark area is represented by what might happen if there were mountains or some other you know, hilly range of terrain. It could be large buildings in a dense urban populated area that the signal has a hard time penetrating through and causes a shadow. Now, on-channel boosters or single frequency networks in FM have been possible for a very long period of time. Uh, they've been regulatorily allowed, uh, although the regulations are a little bit different in every country, and there's been technology to deploy them, at least in principle, uh, for many years. Uh, but the concept, although being simple, of synchronizing the frequency of these transmitters so they can operate seamlessly on the same channel, in real world, uh, the results didn't stack up to the promise. And in many cases, people said, geez, I've tried SFNs or boosters. And while I did improve the signal in some areas, there were a whole bunch of other areas where I had usable signal that now were being destroyed. And in the drawing uh, here on the slide, you can see this red area, which the green area originally uh, shadowed by the mountains now has plenty of signal from the booster, but the booster signal spills over into the red area and it fights with signal from the main uh, transmitter. And so this uh, interference zone, sometimes called the mush zone, uh, is part of the reason that we need to think about uh, more than just having multiple transmitters on the same frequency. <clears throat> now, you know, the use of the same frequencies in a, in a network to improve coverage is, is nothing new. Um, it's used across different types of digital radio and uh, television uh, networks. So uh, DVB-T and T2, ISDB-T, DAB digital radio, uh, for example, all use them. So OFDM carriers can be aligned and, uh, and work very well in a single frequency network. Similarly, mobile phone networks uh, with OFDM have furthered the understanding, uh, not just of single frequency network operation, but also uh, proper network planning and design with uh, towers with highly directionalized antenna, uh, adjusting system timing so you can hand off from one site to the other seamlessly without dropping a call. And so these principles in digital uh, TV and digital radio and uh, mobile uh, telephone networks uh, can all be applied to analog FM, despite the fact that uh, analog FM is a single carrier uh, system. So those are some of the things in addition to planning software that's greatly changed over time. So these planning tools, which we'll talk about a little bit more in detail, have um, have improved that allow you to better plan uh, the network coverage. Technologies evolved. IP networks have become more ubiquitous and allowing broadcasters 
uh, to very cost effectively deploy content over a wide area. And RF device technology has uh, improved. It puts more power in significantly smaller footprints. So when you kind of add up these things that have changed, um, uh, there's uh, not only technology differences, but also really a shift of thinking of thinking of deploying a booster or filling coverage on the same channel is really a single frequency network topology or an SFN network um, is, is to think about it rather than being an extra station that's trying to fill in a coverage area, but thinking about it as a planned part of a mobile network. And one of the things uh, that we've learned over time and some of the deployments we've done is that the principles that we normally would uh, covet for a great main channel FM site would be a uh, uh, high placement of the antenna with a sufficient amount of power and a great look angle into the intended market. So, you know, this could be a very tall uh, tower that it might be on. It could be the top of a mountain, it could be a top of a tall building in the city or um, or some sort of landmark structure. You know, I think in like, you know, Sky Tower in Auckland, I think of, you know, the Empire State Building in the United States, the Eiffel Tower in Paris, these iconic structures that are in the middle of the city are a great place to have your main FM site, but frankly, uh, for fill-in single frequency networks, they're generally not a very good uh, selection because they radiate across a broad area and it's very tough to control them. So you take all these things together and it really gives us a, a view uh, of making a holistic change in how we think of single frequency networks. So to go a little bit more in depth on network design, uh, Again, generally, FM stations have either had uh, one large high power transmitter on a single frequency or a mix of transmitters and powers on multiple frequencies. And you may uh, hope to use something like RDS for uh, program following, but or, or someone may actually have to tune to the next channel. Uh, but single frequency networks have been uh, mainstays in DVB-T and T2 for television or you know, ISDBT, uh, CTTB, the, the different standards. And for DAB, DAB plus digital radio, again, uh, these have been a mainstay of the network. Uh, of course, if you're using a GSM or LTE, the same thing, mobile, mobile data networks are all using this topology of lots of low power transmitters to cover of the network that are all synchronized and planned both from an RF and synchronization standpoint. And so uh, to plan those out, different tools are required than just finding the appropriate regulatory spacing that doesn't uh, cause interference or meets the appropriate interference requirements to say I can fit, you know, 95.4 in the middle of this city. Uh, because it's fully spaced to all the other channels. Uh, so this software uh, takes into account uh, not only uh, the separations needed, but also has the significant types of tools that allows you to plan an S SFN network. ADTI, for example, in their HTZ communications subsidiary has a very powerful tool that we've used um, over time. And these tools, uh, map not only the interference levels between multiple frequencies to determine if this channel can fit, uh, but then in planning an SFN network, it looks at the interference and RF levels between these multiple transmitter sites and allows network planners the ability to understand where the RF's going so antenna design can be uh, are crafted to focus the energy in the area you want to. So if we think of that drawing that we had before, with that one booster in the middle of the area that was shadowed and how RF signals spilled out around it because that was kind of a traditional booster, which was just a small version of a main site, omnidirectional antenna with a certain amount of power. Um, and so these tools give us significantly better capability to do network planning. Now, an example of this, a partner we have called Geo Broadcast Solutions uh, that we've worked with is, is pioneered this concept of using these multiple more like cellular type or mobile network type antenna patterns with clusters of boosters to fill in a geography to very carefully control where the RF goes. So these use highly directional antennas uh, that generally have very high front to back ratios, meaning most of the energy is off the front of the antenna, very little behind it. So uh, antennas, they're very unlike what we might use for a main 
uh, antenna uh, for a main transmitter site. And then the relationship between the patterns, the site selection, the antenna elevation, the amount of effective radiated power, the main and the boosters, directions of propagation, all of these are calculated in uh, to determine what the coverage might look like. So if we look in the drawing uh, here with the large green circle, we can see that that area again that was shadowed by the mountains have been filled in not by one uh, booster that spills over into the side uh, areas or around the terrain, but four boosters that are low to the ground, uh, very uh, highly focused, and then only have very little um, overlap zones outside of the booster area. And so that's the first step is understanding where the RF goes and then designing at an RF level, uh, uh, both uh, from height, power, or should I say all height, power, and directionality in the antennas, how we contain it to a certain area. Now, simply having the RF focused is part of it, but then systems need to be aligned and timed. And so, you know, what might seem obvious is, well, of course, all the frequencies of the transmitters need to be precisely aligned so that we're not beating one transmitter off the other. And that can be done pretty easily today using GPS. But uh, what's not always so clear is the audio path needs precision alignment as well. And this is to ensure that the audio from these two transmitters or multiple transmitters arriving at a specific location or this overlap zone is timed so that the signals um, don't cause interference. Now, Gates Air's Interplex product family has a product called Synchrocast. It's some patented technology we developed that provides real-time adaptive delay to maintain this precision control. So not only can you set the delay for each of these sites, and we'll go into a little bit more how the delays are calculated and what they are, uh, but also as your network changes, so transport over an IP network or even a TDM network is not necessarily deterministic, uh, uh, real-time adaptive delay allows these buffers to be adjusted so that whatever delay uh, you've dialed into the system is maintained despite changes in the network. Now, there's two types of delay we're going to talk about. The first is transport delay. So this accounts for the time it takes the audio to leave your studio or wherever it's generated out to each of the transmitter sites uh, using whatever method you're using. So it could be an IP network, a TDM network, a TDM or IP over RF. Uh, each of them have different delays because these transmitter sites are different lengths uh, geographically away from the studio. And the second delay we need to look at is called propagation delay. So this is the time it takes the RF signal to emanate from each transmitter site. And they're going to meet at some point where these two signals uh, overlap, if you will. And the RF propagates depending upon the distance from the transmitter site. While the rate's the same uh, because uh, the overlap, depending on power, might be not necessarily directly in the middle. Uh, each of those sites is going to have a slightly different uh, time frame of, of uh, propagation delay. So if we think of these in a network, and we're just going to pick two sites here, but you may have three or four or ten number of these sites. Um, uh, in addition to these main delays, and you can see in the drawing, the red line is the transport delay we talked about, and the blue line is the propagation delay. Uh, we need to know about the delays of all the pieces of equipment in the network as well as the network delay itself. So it's important to have identical equipment so that their delay characteristics are all the same. So this means that the transmitters at each of the site need to be the same or at the very least the exciters if they were high power transmitters. Ideally, they're all solid state transmitters. So we don't have, uh, you know, group delay changes as tubes um, uh, get detuned or the tuning changes over time. Uh, and it's important to note that each site is going to have a different uh, total amount of delay to account for uh, the transport delay to each of the sites, which is different. Uh, and then the uh, delay in RF propagation from each of the sites to the reception site. But what uh, we do know is that uh, one of these sites is going to have the longest amount of time going from the studio through the transport link over the air and then to the reception site. 
and the rest of the sites will now need to be delayed to match up uh, to that longest path, plus some additional time to allow a buffer to control uh, the adaptive uh, time control. Now, when we talk about uh, the reason it's so important to have these signals arrive at the reception site simultaneously is that when one or more co-channel signals reaches an analog receiver, the receiver may switch back and forth between these based on the capture effect of the of the radio. Uh, and you know, in the best scenario, the audio is perfectly aligned and the receiver switches back and forth and your ear doesn't hear anything. The more it becomes unaligned, it sounds like a uh, heavy multipath or or uh, a destructive signal cancellation, which creates an unlistenable signal. So anyone who's ever driven to the edge of the coverage of one frequency where it butts into another frequency on the same network with different content knows what happens. You kind of jump back and forth between these and it's just unusable for a large period or a large uh, overlap area. So making sure these signals are in perfect phase and synchronization with one another is, is critical and that the area that it's aligned for is actually very small. So again, back to the reason we talk about controlling the RF uh, signal as to where it goes in the network and containing it so the overlap areas aren't huge uh, because while you can time out the signal and the system, the timing's uh, appropriate only for a very small overlap area. If you go a kilometer in one direction or another, or you know a few hundred meters, the timing's going to be slightly different. Now, the other thing to note is uh, listeners' tolerance, and we'll talk about something we call keep-on scores. Listeners' tolerance for this delay uh, changes whether it's mono or stereo, talk, music, um, et cetera. So it's important to take that into account when uh, defining uh, the network timing, and. Uh, you know, when the amplitude of these signals uh, becomes more equal. So when signals have very different levels, this DDU desirable to undesirable uh, level, the receiver will grab the more powerful signal and stick with it. So there really isn't as much of an issue, but when they're very close, kind of like I said, we have these two competing signals and you're at the edge of each coverage, uh, the radio is going to jump back and forth between them and without proper synchronization. Even if you had the same content on there, it would be very destructive. So proper design of a network, uh, you know, mitigates or inter eliminates interference uh, across these overlap areas through the use of RF planning, audio delay and control and, and alignment. Uh, but it's not just the time. Uh, the phase and pilot level, pilot phase are all critical, of course, carrier frequency, but also modulation levels. You know, these the modulations on each of these, uh, you know, need to be uh, spot on. Uh, you know, within uh, a fraction of a dB of each other. Uh, because again, as the modulation levels are different, uh, the ability to have that seamless alignment is significantly different. And this is why having the same exciter at each of the sites is important because every exciter's modulation characteristics are a little bit different. And if you have these that are different, it really becomes impossible to have good synchronization. Now, I mentioned a thing we called keep on scores. Uh, we did some testing with uh, NPR labs, National Public Radio Labs in the United States and Towson University. And what we did was we created a listener study to find out how bad the interference could be or what type of interference would customers, consumers listen through and at what point did they change the channel. So, you know, we've kind of all been there. You, you roll up to a stoplight or stop sign. You're hearing a little bit of noise, but you'll listen through it because you know on the other side, it's actually going to uh, uh, clear up because it might be multi-path or some shadowing. And if you like the program content, you'll put up with a little bit of noise, but then you get to a point where the noise or the interference or the picket fencing all becomes uh, more aggressive that you know, you're not interested in listening any longer. And so uh, using uh, actual RF signals and, and constructing the interference with these different types of program criteria. We did a significant amount of testing to figure out when did people stop dropping off and listening? When did, you know, the big fall off uh, begin and, and what type of interference levels were tolerated? And we tested across multiple things, mono and stereo modes. So in mono, the signal's more robust. Uh, 
so we don't have as much a distortion. Looking at speech versus music versus somebody voicing over on music. Uh, and also the time arrivals between the signals, how far out of alignment was still acceptable, what the RF ratio between these. And so uh, as these got compiled and calculated, you can kind of see in the purple area is very good, 90 to 100% stayed listening. The green area is kind of like a plateau, uh, which is 80, 90%. But then kind of at the edge of that, it started falling off fairly quickly uh, where the number of people uh, would drop off. And so we used a statistically significant number of samples and data points, and our network design was to uh, the keep on score of 90%. So when we do the network design, it's to make sure that the thresholds don't fall below that 90% uh, listener keep on score. Now, I mentioned something about IP networks earlier. You know, one of the things that's changed over the past number of years is the options for audio transport uh, have become a lot more flexible. You know, there was a time that fixed analog microwaves, uh, satellite or uh, fairly costly E1 and T1 circuits was the only way to distribute audio content. IP was neither uh, wide enough bandwidth uh, broadly available or reliable enough, many felt, for audio distribution. Uh, today, reliable IP networks are fairly ubiquitous uh, and available at uh, pretty cost effective um, monthly fees. And so that's become uh, an option for delivery uh, as well as these uh, codecs offering different types of data compression and audio performance have become more readily available. So uh, the Gates Air Intraplex IP link system using Synchrocast uh, provides a uh, a very uh, robust transport mechanism uh, that gives you uh, the ability to do uh, streaming across IP networks with multiple streams and error mitigation, uh, but also has this precision timing control uh, that allows us uh, to really dial the boosters coverage in. Now, the other thing that's really important that's uh, changed is generally because of bandwidth requirements, audio distribution was done in the left and right uh, domain using linear or compressed audio. And that would take up a full E1 generally for uh, one uncompressed pair. Uh, well, the advancement now in the AES-192 standard for digital composite MPX audio or analog composite uh, allows us uh, to transport that MPX or composite signal across the network for alignment. And if you're doing HD radio, uh, the IP Connect uh, system allows us to send the HD radio E to X or um, uh, you know, uh, exporter to Exciter stream and, and have that time aligned as well. Now, why I mentioned the MPX being really important for SFN applications is that as I mentioned before, this alignment that needs to happen all through the system and that we need to have identical equipment. When we're delivering left and right audio to each of the sites, every single transmitter site has to have a stereo generator. The stereo generator has to have its pilot frequency locked to all the others. In addition to the transmitter's carrier, the pilot phase needs to be identical. And the performance of the exciter uh, stereo generator needs to be identical generally digital ones. Well, when we now can transport MPX audio across the network, I can now use the stereo generator in the audio processor that can be located at the studio. Because again, the other thing might be, I could pre-process my audio, pre-process my audio and send it over the discrete link and then only have the stereo generator at the end. Some people have tried to put separate audio processors at every site and again, the problem there is all of these things have different timing delays and different uh, performance characteristics and they're never adjusted exactly identically. So uh, when we go through and only have one audio processor and one stereo generator, it really simplifies the deployment and it eliminates all these multiple steps of stereo generation alignment. Now we had a, a good customer in New Zealand who really, uh, you know, I, I would say was, uh, you know, a leading, uh, uh, expert in deploying these SFN networks over the past decade plus. 
Uh, and they recently upgraded from one of our traditional synchrocasts using uh, E1 circuits and um, um, microwaves with left minus right uh, or left and right distribution to using MPX distribution and the common stereo generator using uh, uh, Flexiva fax uh, exciters and using the um, Intraplex uh, MPX distribution, and there were actually was fairly significant uh, performance on the network. So even though the SFN had already been located, the antennas were the same, transmitter powers were the same, the sites were the same. Uh, dialing in and using the new exciters and distributing composite audio or MPX audio uh, created a much uh, better experience in the overlap zones, and frankly, the audio performance was improved. Now. Uh, transmitters over time have gotten far simpler. You know, there was a time that uh, certainly for tubes, uh, much beyond several watts or tens of watts uh, were done in solid state. And then uh, the rest of the amplification was done in tubes, which makes uh, for much more difficult time alignment and um, performance characteristics, symmetrical group delay and other such things. Well. In addition to having digital exciters that have identical modulation characteristics versus analog exciters, the development of 50 volt LDMOS technology in these very compact uh, high efficiency devices allow us to put an awful lot of power in a very small footprint. So for example, a uh, uh, Flexiva Fax 3.5K transmitter can give you 3,850 watts in four rack units and only weigh about 25 uh, kilos or 56 pounds. So, you know, even today, there are many uh, transmitter manufacturers with a three and a half kilowatt transmitter is a full rack cabinet. Uh, but when you're trying to place booster sites, especially when we talk about these low to the ground booster sites, having um, uh, low power transmitters in a very compact space uh, makes it a lot simpler and lowers your uh, cost to deploy. In addition, things like the GPS receiver are now integrated in the transmitter, and that can also provide signaling to lock the interplex to GPS, where in the past, GPS was a fairly expensive outboard box uh, that needed to get linked into uh, the exciters and the uh, interplex at the site. So we'll look at a couple case studies. One that we deployed about two years ago in the United States in Los Angeles, KPCC. So this is what we refer to as a class B station. Uh, so it um, uh, typically uh, 500 feet above ground. Uh, that station would have an equivalent ERP of 50,000 watts. This one's at a very high site, uh, so it only has 600 watts uh, ERP. So when we talked about, you know, these ideal FM sites with broad coverage area, yes, indeed, it has a fairly large area, uh, but there are, are portions of the coverage um, that while they're within the predicted contour, this red line, uh, they have certain shadowing uh, and they're highly desirable areas to cover. So again, with GL Broadcast Solutions, our, our partner, this uh, SFN network, which they term max casting, uh, we installed a couple of boosters uh, in this area of Santa Monica and Beverly Hills in Los Angeles, which had significant shadowing previously. Uh, and you can see the left uh, image shows signal levels uh, with just the main site operating and the white that you see in the coverage area are areas that have in, insufficient or very low uh, amounts of uh, RF coverage and the green and yellow and red is much uh, higher levels. So we can take a look and see that uh, these two boosters were put into place. Uh, both pointing away from the main transmitter site and overlapping uh, into the ocean. Now, generally you're required not to extend your coverage, at least in the United States, beyond the your uh, predicted uh, coverage uh, uh, levels or, or range, this uh, protected contour, uh, which is uh, red in the left uh, image and blue in the right image, uh, but <clears throat> the rules allow that you can uh, extend that area if it's actually over water. Uh, so uh, we take advantage by having high signal levels uh, because the interference, if there were any, would be over the Pacific Ocean. Now, uh, this area just beyond this protected contour uh, 
where you see this red line is um, uh, Malibu, which is a very desirable uh, suburb of Los Angeles. Uh, in the prior coverage, the coverage in that area was spotty and, and not, um, uh, not well served. And we can see by zooming in on the coverage map uh, that that area, so it's it's fairly rugged terrain that goes up. So there's really only a very small strip along the uh, along the ocean where the oceanfront homes and such are. Uh, uh, we can see that the signal level has been drastically improved. Now, what's this all equate to? So in the United States, a measurement uh, from a company called Nielsen does uh, uh, market surveys. And so KPCC, this station ran uh, between a 1.3 to 1.5 average quarter hour rating uh, prior to the implementation of max casting, which went in in uh, April of 2017. And then in February of 2018, not quite a year later, the station had gone up to a three share. So, you know, uh, doubling uh, their um, uh, ratings, and this is the number two market in the United States. So fairly significant. Uh, increase in um, in listenership and in their case the associated underwriting that went with it. Now uh, these signal improvement systems can be used not only for stations with very low power but also those with relatively high power. Another class B station in the United States uh, WXLO in Boston, Massachusetts, a large city on the east coast runs about 37 kilowatts of actual power. Uh, because they're again a little bit over height and we can see their coverage uh, on the left. So while we do see a lot of green, uh, the transmitter is actually located well outside of the city and on the right hand side we see the blue and the white areas are in downtown Boston. After we put in these multiple uh, boosters uh, and we can see some uh, red areas around uh, FM 1, 2, and 3, the booster sites, uh, we can see that the, the green, uh, yellow, and red uh, in the contour areas has significantly improved. Now, when I mentioned the ratings in the United States, the method that's used uh, is not a diary reporting in some markets, but a device called a, a portable people meter, PPM. And this decodes or it's listening constantly to what someone uh, might be hearing. So if I walk into a store, for example, or I'm in my office and the radio's on uh, and I'm carrying one of these meters, it registers that that's what I'm listening to or I'm in my car, I'm in my home. And that's done by watermarking uh, some signaling through the audio that then this system actually decodes. Uh, and so uh, what we did was used a device that uh, analyzed this watermarking and in the left, we did drive testing to determine uh, what type of messages were being decoded. And so on WXLO, before the improvements were made, we can see in this case, the blue blocks are, are zero decoded messages and the red is 100%. After the signal improvements have been made with the SFN network, uh, now the the signal level decoding uh, for the PPM meters uh, is uh, almost 100% in every place. So, you know, if if um, even if someone were listening through, you know, weaker signal, they found it suitable. It was a fixed radio. They got it in the corner of the office and it worked fine, or their car was able to receive it. But the people meter was not able to decode the data. It's just as if the the listeners weren't listening. So this has a significant impact on the the financial performance of stations. Now here's another snapshot and a broader picture of the before. So again, as I mentioned, the WXLO transmitter site is in the upper left hand corner, the city of Boston uh, is uh, uh, to the right near the edge of the contour. And then after the boosters have been added, we can see significant signal improvement, you know, in the highly populated uh, Boston core. Now also, uh, the nomenclature on the bottom says about 600,000 population coverage were added by this you know, people that can now have uh, usable signal levels. Um, and um, uh, stations had uh, a significant impact in the ratings uh, as uh, as a result of this. And uh, 
uh, we found that to be fairly significant. So uh, this gives you a little bit better look as we we talk about areas. The blue represents um, mobile uh, uh, stereo listening, and the green uh, is where the signal level is uh, improved enough to allow that. And so we can see after the boosters, uh, the blue blocks in the areas all go to green and the block numbers and sizes represent populations. And so this takes census data and overlaps it with the station's target audience. So if we just kind of back up for a minute, we can see in this case, the station's programming targets women 25 to 54. And it shows that while there's significant numbers of them in these areas, the blue group shows that the signal performance is subpar such that even if they wanted to listen to the station, they wouldn't be able to. And then after uh, the signal performance, we can see in that same area, all the blocks are now green. So pretty significant improvement to the station's coverage. The other thing we're able to do, and we'll talk about geo-targeting a little bit more in depth, but even within a single frequency network, we can have different RDS data on each of these zones or transmitters. So that allows you to have different advertising content uh, in these areas uh, such that you can do targeted ads. So if there's a car dealer or a restaurants that's located in the, uh, for example, green WXLO FM3 area, we can have different uh, signaling and content on RDS than we have in those in you know downtown or in the in the orange area, which opens up some significant revenue opportunities. Another station that runs um, both uh, analog FM and HD radio in the United States and San Diego had some challenges. Their objective, although they had a full power station in the middle of the market, uh, there was significant growth of the suburbs in the northern area of the market and the signal was less uh, usable there. So the objective was to improve not only analog audio coverage, but also HD radio coverage. And so as I had mentioned earlier, we used the Interplex IP Connect that allowed us to take both MPX audio, so again, the composite and the EDX stream uh, for the digital radio to the transmitter site. Now this was installed recently and we'll go in depth into it more, uh, but uh, pretty significant improvements. So the station went in a month over month increase after the signal performance improvement uh, from a 1.8 share to a 2.5 share. So a fairly large increase. Uh, and, uh, you know, a comment here from um, GR Rogers, the market technical operation manager. And, and really, and we'll see this on the drawing, this Interstate 15 or I-15 is a major highway uh, where uh, commuters previously had uh, substandard uh, performance. So in this area, we can see again, the large red line showing the, the predicted uh, contour of the station. And in these North County area, Escondido, Oceanside, Vista, uh, and such, uh, lots of white and blue areas, which are much lower signal levels. The main transmitter site is down in the city of San Diego. That's why we see plenty of red, uh, uh, green, and yellow there. Uh, but these areas in the in the kind of center of the screen, on the upper side, uh, was the desired areas of improvement. In this case, five boosters were put together, located as FM 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, with the kind of red, blue, orange, teal, and yellow uh, contours. Again, very directional antennas uh, focused on providing coverage in uh, some very specific population areas. Uh, and we can see uh, significant improvement in the signal in that area, which can help explain part of the improvement in, uh, in listenership. Now, I mentioned HD radio also being critical. Well, many times, uh, you know, all this technology can be used in analog FM. Uh, for those using HD radio, uh, improvement in coverage is also important. So we did some drive testing, and on the left-hand side, we can see uh, along this important highway, this Route 15 or Interstate 15, that uh, for large segments, uh, HD radio reception was not possible. Now, analog may or may not have been possible there, but definitely HD radio wasn't decoding. Uh, the green is indicating the stretches that were. After these booster systems or single frequency networks were deployed, uh, same drive test was done, uh, driving up that same stretch of highway. And we can now see that the red area 
that had previously been uh, uh, driven without uh, solid reception uh, now had solid green HD uh, coverage in the entire area. So very significant perform performance improvements. Now, all of those, uh, you know, I mentioned geolocational uh, uh, targeted content, and we talked about that in terms of RDS carriers earlier. Um, but there's another version of uh, SFN networks using this cluster booster system uh, called zone casting. And uh, this is a, a, a different implementation, but using the very same technology that allows these zones or these booster clusters to have different audio content. And the best way to think of the applicability of that is if you've uh, ever seen targeted advertisement, if you have uh, cable television, or uh, you know, certainly if you're watching internet streaming or listening to internet radio, you know you can target different ads to different uh, geographies. Uh, well, by doing this, this would allow someone to split up a city to have multiple zones to have different uh, commercial content, for example, or different weather or news or other such things that might want to be targeted to a, a certain geography. Uh, and while we'll step through the technical criteria around this and some field trials we've done, you know, I think it's important to note that this has significant uh, financial opportunity for stations. Uh, you know, in some of the largest markets, only the top one or two car dealers, for example, uh, advertise on the largest stations because it's unlikely someone's going to drive 100 miles to the other side of the metro to buy a car. Uh, but uh, if we were able to geo target in the neighborhoods and areas where uh, restaurants and car dealers and uh, dry cleaning shops and other neighborhood type stores, uh, banks, where people uh, go to them that's close to the geography they're in, uh, one could sell multiple uh, commercials at the same time in different geographies uh, and allow people to buy those and, and uh, you know, now have significant revenue improvements. So Gates Air and Geo Broadcast Solutions have performed uh, three field trials uh, in the United States uh, with FCC authorization starting uh, 10 years ago in Salt Lake City. Uh, and then in Florida, and then uh, most recently in Milwaukee. Uh, and it's important to note that uh, these were some radically different terrains. So Salt Lake City had terrain shielding, and as you might imagine, it worked very well. Sebring, Florida, and Milwaukee were both uh, flat. And the Milwaukee design has actually been deployed and commercially operational in France, and we'll talk about that uh, coming up here uh, shortly. The design criteria use these keep on scores that we talked about uh, for audio listening with NPR and Towson Labs uh, and is a proven architecture that's been deployed. Now, uh, in many countries, having separate content on the booster of single frequency network uh, is allowed. There aren't restrictions. The United States currently requires the same content on each of the boosters. Uh, but a petition for rulemaking has been open and it's open for comments now. So the zone casting test uh, that we did in um, in Milwaukee uh, uh, was kind of a hybrid system. So most of the time the boosters were on running simulcast content. So the same benefits we talked about of giving a better signal performance, uh, but there were breakaway times that the zone uh, had different content. So in the image on the right, we see that the red is the main zone for WIIL uh, and the uh, right uh, zone breakaway is um, in blue, had uh, separate content. Now when we focus on this, there actually were a number of uh, seven nodes or seven boosters at three common sites and then a fourth separate site. Uh, to create these uh, zone breakages uh, within the downtown um, Milwaukee area. Now the power levels, as I mentioned this was a 50 kilowatt station. The power levels at these sites run from an ERP of five kilowatts uh, down to a couple hundred watts. Uh, and several of them, and now we'll show a rooftop example, but several of them were um, uh, multiple transmitters on the same site pointing in different directions. So you can see here these seven sites, uh, uh, two transmitters at each of three of the sites 
uh, with orientation virtually back to back. So when we look at uh, this, just to give you an example, uh, in the case of uh, the the left two drawings, these were cases where we had uh, same site, but uh, boosters pointing in opposite directions, creating that very sharp edge or split in the zone. Uh, and uh, uh, the one on the right is an additional site uh, that's used uh, also to manage the signal overlap. Deployment of these, very small. So this was a rooftop site. The left uh, picture shows the the non-penetrating roof mount and the antennas that were mounted. So these were uh, uh, stacked Yaggies in a, a diagonal a polarization pattern um, that we can see here. Uh, two uh, relatively small transmitters. Uh, again, uh, those uh, could do up to three kilowatts. And then there's uh, an IP link and some IP bridging uh, uh, capability in the rack. Uh, and the signal distribution here, the reason why we're seeing this very small microwave antenna, uh, these sites were all linked together with IP microwave radios. So there actually weren't fixed uh, monthly costs uh, uh, for reoccurring uh, links. These were actually all done over IP microwaves. Now the listening test was done driving through the zones and listening to the switchovers. Uh, and while we talked about, you know, before that we have very sophisticated software that gets used, uh, this area maps out. We can see kind of where the red circles are. These color blocks shows the area of projected interference. The blue uh, listening would be to the main zone. The yellow listening in the, the split away zone. Uh, and then the transition zone uh, are where the tests, uh, you know, you could you could go from one zone to the other in listening. And so fairly, um, a fairly straightforward and limited interference. Now, you know, the proofs in the pudding, the station, you know, general manager, uh, you know, indicates that in their target audience during the time period that uh, we had this testing on, a uh, significant increase in the um, uh, in the, the ratings and listenership. Again, so that's kind of from the uh, signal density standpoint and uh, definitely combats the concern that geez, if I have these breakaway separate content, I'm actually going to drive listeners away. And that's the number one question we get about this. Well, geez, how do you avoid interference? Well, we talked a lot about the network design earlier with identical content. When we have separate content, all those same uh, characteristics um, apply, but there's some other things to take into account. That uh, most of the time it's identical content on all these transmitters. So if you were breaking away one stop set an hour, a couple different times an hour, there's only two to three minutes that would actually have different content on it. So a station, somebody listening to the station, it needs to be during a time that uh, there's different content on the booster. So, you know, statistically that gets much smaller. Someone actually has to be tuned to uh, that particular frequency and they have to be in the point where you're crossing over from one zone to the other. Because if I'm already in the zone and my receiver has captured booster four, and booster four goes from having identical content to having different content, I would never know because it's an audio switch, just like I was listening from one song to the next or one commercial to the next. But the only time I might actually hear something is if I'm passing through this border zone. Uh, and then the audio changes pretty quickly from one sound to the other. Uh, because of the RF design with these high front to back ratio antennas, uh, it, it has a fairly quick uh, shift from one to the other uh, using these planning tools. So when you break it down, really uh, less than 1% of station listeners actually ever would be in this zone uh, during a transition time. And frankly, uh, we see this same type of transition in um, in a mobile television that does a dissimilar content. Now, another place that's actually commercially deploying this is in France. So the country of France has a nationwide uh, single frequency network on 107.1 for highway information. Uh, this is a system that's been using Synchrocast uh, uh, since its inception uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, and is now migrated to IP. Uh, 
but while it's one uh, single frequency network, there are actually multiple regions of different content and different operations on the same channel. So uh, again, this, this map here shows where all these highways are that are covered, uh, but as we go across, there are actually several different formats uh, that are on here. Now, these are full broadcast stations. Uh, while they're traffic oriented, it's not just a loop of traffic content. There's uh, music and uh, information and news, uh, but uh, definitely uh, traffic information and it's geolocationally targeted. So these have these very low to the ground uh, sites with uh, relatively low power. There's about 1,100 of them across the country. Uh, and then some of them, these border sites with these antennas pointing both ways, uh, as we see in this uh, drawing here in the center, are what uh, uh, defines the border and, and has the split. So these have two transmitters and two synchrocast systems at them to allow a different content. And these sites are pretty close. They're about every eight to 10 kilometers um, uh, for frequency reuse. So in the network planning tool, we can see that you know this line that kind of comes from the upper left down to the bottom right is the highway. The coverage is designed uh, you know across this, and uh, we can see these uh, 200 watt sites. There's a number of them, uh, but here with these back-to-back -back antennas, uh, you know we can see the the going from one zone to the other. There's pretty high uh, levels of RF signal at that location. And if we zoom in on this site, so in this uh, uh, photographic image, we can see by this bridge that's crossing just to the left of both of the divided highway is a pole, and that's actually the transmitter site that has uh, the transmitters in a small box at the bottom, and the antennas are pointing up and down the highway. And so uh, we've uh, tested and can calculate that this area of signal overlap is approximately 20 to 70 meters. So if we think about that of driving down the highway, uh, it's it's one or two seconds. So when we talk about the the transition zone, even in a point where there is different content, uh, it's uh, it's minimal. If you know I'm listening to it, it might sound like a blip of multipath or interference that I might normally be used to seeing um, as I drive around. So while we talked about a lot of different uh, topics here i think you know it's important to note that you know radio at its heart is uh, local mobile and free which are all excellent value propositions uh, and you know despite every time we turn around seeming to have yet some other expert on media consumption declaring that everybody's listening to streaming uh, listenership and um, the surveys across all the major countries show that, you know, well over 90% of the people listen to radio every week. In fact, it's the most consumed. And when you look at the number of people watching TV or streaming, uh, you know, or other forms of listening to music, it's all significantly less or listening to other audio content. Uh, but, you know, even if you've got a great value proposition and a bunch of people are using the, the medium, if your station has areas where listeners are that can't receive it, even if they really love uh, your content, it's going to be hard uh, to have them listen and hard to make money. You know, FM, SFN networks have, have been available in the regulations for a long time, but some of these earlier issues people had uh, in determining that they just don't work uh, are really kind of, you know, old news. It's, it's uh, changed significantly over the past several years. Our testing in digital radio, even though we've been doing analog FM for longer, digital uh, FM for HD radio is uh, newer, but the results are similar uh, and the field tests have proven that. The advances we see in technology today from IP networks, from uh, RF density, from in, in um, uh, device capability, from sophisticated modulation, as well as planning networks, uh, software for uh, network planning, is significantly improved and can give you tools uh, to reach your listeners better, increase coverage, uh, and get better ratings. And really, that's what it breaks down to. Uh, while the technology is interesting, it's the ability to uh, better market your station and uh, you know meet your mandate, whether it's a public service broadcaster uh, trying to serve the population or whether it's a commercial operator 
who wants to have uh, you know ratings and the associated revenue with it, uh, today's single frequency networks are a very powerful tool. So thank you. We'll be glad to take some questions. I think uh, Teresa will open it up for those and we'll try to answer as many as we can for you. Thanks, Rich. Uh, before we start some of the Q&A uh, question and answer section here, I just want to make a couple of announcements. Um, so first of all, uh, this uh, session has been recorded and you would be able to find it after the session is over uh, using the same link that you used to sign on. Um, it'll also be posted on our GeekZero.com channel uh, in our media section and also on our YouTube channel. In addition, we will be adding this webinar to our educational video library at GatesAirUniversity.com, which is our online hub of lessons and webinars about broadcast engineering. And if you're in the United States and didn't know, this webinar, like all of the webinars on GatesAir.com, qualifies for one half SBE recertification credit. And this is identified under category I of the SBE's recertification schedule. For more information about that, please visit the certification section at SBE.org. So now on to our questions. All right, Rich. Um, you've got a few questions here in queue. Uh, first from Kirk Nesbitt. A uh, couple cost questions. Uh, what was the total cost of the KPCC project? Oh, um, yeah, that's a, a good question. Uh, the, the the capital equipment actually wasn't incredibly expensive. There were fairly low power transmitters. I want to say there were two two sites uh, plus the exciter for the main and the linking. Uh, so I would estimate that the equipment cost was, uh, you know, less than fifty thousand dollars. Now there is some, uh, you know, study costs and deployment costs. Um, but uh, we can go find out the specifics and and let you know. Uh, the engineering costs generally aren't incredibly high, um, so uh, uh, you know I, I think um, it's probably a percentage of the project, but I, I don't recall exactly. But I can tell you the equipment costs were under fifty thousand dollars. All right. Uh, the next one from Kirk was in regards to the case study for KWFN. Um, and it was, uh, what was the incremental increase in annual operating exp uh, operating costs? Yeah, I'm not sure what their uh, rent was for each of the sites. Um, I know that uh, the stations did go through, uh, you know, a pretty detailed ROI before they made the investments on these and uh, were able to determine that Having the type of listener increase that they were able to support, such as the, uh, you know, we saw there the increase in their uh, uh, Nielsen ratings, you know, more than paid it off. Probably the one thing to remember is compared to the type of sites we might normally be thinking of as site rental, these are generally very low to the ground sites. So the types of places you can go for site rental is uh, significantly reduced in, in cost. So we're not looking for a high power broadcast site. So some of these are rooftops, you know, a, a couple story building uh, or, uh, you know, perhaps a cell site. Now, many of those are actually still run by what we think of as larger tower companies. They have a lot of these kinds of sites, but they're usually not the ones that we think of uh, in terms of, of uh, you know, broadcast sites. So uh, the places that we would look is, is actually much broader. Um, so I do know when we've compared the cost before, is a general rule these types of sites are in the, you know, 20% to 25% range in cost as compared to uh, a traditional, you know, main broadcast site. All right. Um, how does MPX simplify network design? Does it need fewer aligned stereo generators while distributing a full MPX signal? Yeah, that's exactly right. So in a traditional design with left and right stereo sent, uh, uh, discrete signals were distributed to all of the sites and then either an outboard, but uh, a line stereo generator or an onboard, meaning on the exciter stereo generator uh, were required. And so in addition to synchronizing the frequency of the transmitter, 
the pilot frequency all needed to be locked and the pilot phase all needed to be locked so that these weren't uh, fighting against each other. And then, you know, there was whatever the level characteristics of the audio levels coming into each of these needed to be precisely adjusted. So what really simplifies it is when you step back to having, uh, you know, one stereo generator, you take out all of that alignment capability or alignment requirement, should I say, because now I have whatever the stereo generator is. So if I have a Orban or an Omnia or whoever's audio processor you want to use, um, you're able to do that. Now, the other thing that, you know, some believe is that the stereo generators and these audio processors, um, you know, can be, uh, have better filtering. Uh, some of them employ composite clipping. So you have some capabilities that most of the transmitter manufacturers, you know, ourselves included, we have a, a great standard stereo generator, but it's not really an audio processing tool. So I think there are two benefits. One is it simplifies the alignment because we don't have to align all of these separate stereo generators. And then second, uh, the the stereo generator and whatever sort of loudness control that it might have in clipping or filtering and other such things is all done uh, centrally in your audio processor. Great, we have another one from Kirk. Uh, can you talk about any performance differences in using CP versus HP antennas? Uh, well, I mean, you know, I would say that uh, generally, vertical polarization or circular uh, usually has better performance when we think of people in an automobile. When we think about most cars, while there was a time uh, cars all had vertical antennas, today they're embedded in glass and, you know, they're hidden and curved. They've got different orientations. So uh, while we certainly have done some with horizontal only antennas, uh, it's been pretty rare. Most of them have either been, uh, you know, circular to polarization or kind of like we showed this off axis um, uh, vertical design. So, you know, while I'm not a, a an antenna designer and, and don't pretend to be one, my practical experience every time uh, I have upgraded something from horizontal to circular polarization or adding some amount of vertical has been significant improvement in coverage. Now, I would also say is kind of an uh, corollary to that, we're seeing the same type of thing in um, digital television. Uh, for FM guys, circular polarization, you know, has been around for a long, long time. And television, while there was some movement in the 80s uh, with the idea of improving color performance, most television and certainly almost all DTV antennas have, have been horizontal. Is uh, the digital TV guys have been in the US going through repack and other countries as well. But having an eye towards targeting mobile devices, uh, having a certain amount of vertical polarization in the uh, antenna actually has pretty significant improvements in the usability of the signal. Uh, and so some studies have been done by Qualcomm and some others uh, uh, for television distribution to mobile devices and having at least uh, a 30% vertical element uh, or vertical plane, so meaning you know, they didn't have to be 100% circular, uh, had a pretty significant increase in uh, the usable signal. So I think the short answer is yes, having circular or, or at least some amount of vertical would be beneficial versus horizontal. All right, this question's from Bob. Uh, with asymmetrical sidebands, is there a potential for HD radio SFNs to cause interf uh, interference to adjacent channel stations that are also running HD radio? Yeah, that's a, a, a good question. Um, generally, when the network design is done, right, there's a certain uh, signal strength as you get to the edge of the contour. So while the network design isn't allowed to extend your contours, so based on that, you shouldn't see, uh, you know, you shouldn't see additional interference created. What what can actually happen is that uh, you'll have a higher signal density at the edge of the contour. So today, you know, from the main site out to the edges, you have, um, uh, you know, you have a fairly equal uh, degradation of, of signal level 
densities closest to the transmitter. When you put a boosters or an SFN at the edge, so for the primary station, the advantage is the signal density at the edge is now similar to the signal density close up. And so you're containing that energy within your protected contour, so it is indeed legal, but the performance uh, uh, difference at the receiver is significantly different because you've got a much higher RF field there. So I think the answer would be, it, based on what we've seen, you don't create uh, interference that's um, not allowed, if I would say, or you know, the operations are within the parameters. But you know, you do now have a, a signal generator that's closer to that adjacent channel station, for example, at the edge of the primary station's contour with a higher uh, RF signal level. So it is possible that, you know, perhaps if you were an adjacent channel uh, and you were at the edge of, of a primary channel's coverage area uh, with HD radio running now, the primary station's signal level is higher. Now, like I said, the designs don't allow you to uh, put energy beyond your contours and they're pretty tightly contained. Uh, but receivers, you know, we all know are far more sensitive uh, than, um, and than they had been in the past and people often enjoy coverage areas far beyond their predicted contours. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I think, I think while they're all legal and nobody's creating uh, interference, you know, a lot of times people have enjoyed uh, reception in areas that they were never predicted, predicted to receive or protected to receive. All right, next question from Paul Montoya. Uh, is building penetration taken into account in planning for booster power levels? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, the short answer is yes. So uh, in the network tools, so sometimes, um, when people do network planning and an example in the early days of digital whether it was digital tv or digital radio um, i think not as much study had been done about signal levels within the building and understanding what type of attenuation different types of buildings had so you know the original promise of digital was you know for a one hundredth of the power you could cover this massive area well without obstructions yeah, it certainly does work that way. But if you're in a city that's got, you know, dense buildings or, you know, frankly, even a suburb that's got, you know, a, a couple story office building or a typical house, the type of attenuation uh, into the building is um, uh, is somewhat significant. Now, as I mentioned before, the planning tools coming from the mobile, like land mobile radio or or uh, you know, uh, wireless telephone, I'll take that into account because right, you're targeting a very small device. So if I'm using these tools to plan like a first responder network, if the police or firemen are in a building, you know, it's life and death if they can't communicate on the radio. So these planning tools are, are, are well proven and understand the type of attenuations buildings have. And so your, your question's spot on. That's one of the great things about boosters and when we think about the station uh, in Boston, you know, that's one of the benefits that they had is that even though their contour showed that the Worcester station fully covered Boston, its usability uh, at the fringe wasn't so great because of the signal uh, density was lower and you've got, you know, some fairly large structures. So uh, the boosters can help increase uh, building penetration pretty significantly. So great, great question. You're you're spot on in thinking about one of the really good ways to use boosters uh, uh, to give you a more usable signal. All right, just a, uh, a note from Hal Neller. Also, you also have to watch IF spacing at the booster sites if there's uh, there could be conflicts there as well. Yeah, uh, thanks, Hal. You're uh, and and Hal's had a front row seat to to several of these, so. Um, all of those get taken into account with the network planning. So while I've kind of talked about it as a tool, you know, it's it's as I was telling someone uh, yesterday, uh, you know, it's not like saying, can I fit frequency X into, uh, you know, Quincy, Illinois, where our factory is, you know, that's kind of a one type of an objective that you use frequency planning tools in, but designing, uh, you know, a booster network, especially in areas, uh, you know, if you think of the northeastern United States, lots of short space stations, very dense. Uh, so it's a, it's a, 
a challenging environment and frankly similar in you know much of Europe uh, and other parts of the world. All right, uh, Rob Anders would like to know uh, how well has the system worked dealing with co-channel interference, temperature inversion, and skywave interference? Well, I, if I start with co-channel, uh, you know, by definition, you're putting a higher level of signal uh, from the desirable station uh, closer to where these listeners are. So if I think of just that, um, you know, that's one of the things that's pretty effective. So if you're in a market, for example, where you've got, you know, some uh, uh, closely spaced co-channel stations and, you know, your your contour says I should have usable signal out to X, but, you know, it becomes less usable because perhaps the, uh, the co-channel has a better look angle, has a different, you know, different topography uh, directed to your desired listening area. Uh, by having boosters in that area, you can pretty significantly impact uh, the customer's usable experience because you're putting a higher level of RF density right up to the edge of the contour. So the radio is going to much more easily capture your desired signal, right? Now, you know, relative to, you know, uh, atmospherics and so forth, you know, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, qualified to predict that. What I will say is generally what we've experienced is uh, when you've had areas that were susceptible to some of these things, having a uh, higher power, uh, more uh, signal density close to the listener, that's usually what won out. Um, is most of the time what we've seen when you have these is that you, you know, you have some signal that's coming in for whatever our reason, uh, and it's overcoming the, the close by signal. And if we think about it, we're almost never see these types of things right next to the transmitter because the signal density is so high that we're not impacted by inversions and some of these other things. Uh, the further you get away from it, you're more susceptible to that. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say that I'm an expert on that, nor would I say, you know, almost any consultant's going to want to, you know, predict what that's going to be. But I would say as a general rule, when you increase the RF density closer to where the receiver is, uh, you're going to have a far more reliable uh, reception and the, the customer's experience or the consumer is going to have a much better experience. All right, looks like the last one in the queue here. Uh, what infrastructure is typically used to get signal to booster sites? Yeah, great question. Uh, virtually all the ones we're doing now are, are IP based. So, you know, traditionally we've used TDM networks. Uh, and so uh, the uh, Synchrocast system in our Interplex family not only transports the audio, but has the precision time delay. And so that's where you know, look, there's lots of ways to move audio around and and there are even a couple of ways that you can move composite around. But, you know, make no mistake about it. Uh, when we talked about timing earlier, that's a critical portion to make all of this work. Just getting the signal there and being close, it will be an improvement over having, you know, uh, totally unaligned uh, audio. But, um, uh, that's a pretty important portion. So the Interplex generally rides on most of the time they're, you know, um, uh, telco provided circuits. We have some people that have used, you know, their own fiber interconnect. We have a number that have used microwave radios providing um, uh, previously T1 and E1 uh, services, but now pretty commonly IP. And so like I think we had in the rooftop picture in Milwaukee, the kind of miniature uh, dish there, those were some some IP radios that linked these sites together. Uh, and so that allowed them to shift, you know, to an upfront cost for, you know, I, the IP radios uh, in some cases are not very expensive uh, versus a paid service. But I would say generally, if we went through all of the ones that we've done, they're almost all a leased service from, you know, some uh, IP provider. That looks like all we have. Teresa, you still out there? I am. So thanks, Rich, for the presentation and answering the questions. And thanks to everyone for your participation in the question and answer sessions. 
Um, again, just to let you, everybody know again that this uh, webinar was recorded and it will be available on gatesair.com in our media section, our YouTube channel, or using the same link that you use to log into today's presentation. It'll also be on gatesairuniversity.com. Um, so if you uh, want to join us again, we have another webinar coming up on Tuesday, May 5th at 10 a.m. and 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And it will be our uh, next uh, series, our next event in our series of our virtual event webinars. Um, and it will be digital radio, a preview of the latest standards, HD radio, DAV, and DRM. This will be again presented by Rich Redman, president of Gates Air International. He will cover digital radio's most popular standards today, the status of current technology, advanced features that are offered, new revenue streams enabled, receiver availability, and costs to deploy them. If you need more information about this webinar and many more that we have coming up, visit gatesair.com slash v hyphen events. And if you have any ideas for future webinar topics or course material for Gatesair University, please let us know at marketing at gatesair.com. So thank you for everyone again for attending this Gatesair Connect event. From all of us at Gatesair, stay safe, stay happy, and let's stay connected.